developments there have been a lot of rumors about expansion no expansion there's also been some you know hopes for example venezuela joining now there's reports that uh, it's not necessarily on the list for the next round of membership expansion. We know that there's dozens and dozens and dozens, 30 plus countries that want to join. What have you been hearing about the upcoming BRICS summit and, and what we might expect? Yeah, well, you know, before all of these summits, are, there are always so many excited rumors about they're going to launch the new BRICS currency and all this. It's hard to know what's actually going on because these countries, understandably, are trying to keep things pretty quiet. Um, given how much they're being targeted by the West. What, what I do expect to see is a more deepening economic integration, um, especially, you know, I've, I know some people who work at the New Development Bank, which is the BRICS Bank, and there's a lot of discussion of trying to de-dollarize their loans. That's a big issue. I, unfortunately, in the short term, I don't think we're going to see the, the highly vaunted BRICS currency yet. I think this is a, a medium to long-term project. There are a lot of complications I mean, uh, especially given how the economic infrastructure that has been used for decades is just so deeply embedded in international trade and investment that it's difficult in just a few years to replace that. I do think, again, in the medium to long term, it will be replaced. But again, these things don't happen in a year or two. But what we are seeing is more and more economic integration, especially through the use of local currencies. And this is something that the New Development Bank has prioritized the current President of the New Development Bank is Dilma Rousseff, who is the leftist former president of Brazil from the Workers' Party. She has been close with the Chinese. In fact, President Xi Jinping just gave her a top award congratulating her. And um, one of the things that she's really trying to do with some of her economists is de-dollarize the loans that they've been giving to developing countries, more and more of which are trying to join the New Development Bank as an alternative to the World Bank. Because, of course, the World Bank, which is dominated by the U.S., demands many conditionalities on countries, whereas the NDB, the BRICS Bank, does not. So that's one of the main priorities. We see a lot of BRICS countries de-dollarizing their, inter their bilateral trade. So Russia and China now, they do more than 90% of their bilateral trade in their local currencies. And in fact, this was quietly admitted by the IMF, China now settles more than half of its own bilateral trade in yuan, not in U.S. dollars. That number has increased very significantly. So I think in the short term, what's going to happen is more and more BRICS countries and more and more countries in the global south in general that are not even part of BRICS yet, they're going to de-dollarize their trade through using local currencies or using other currencies, maybe if they have a, a very... Um, they have a very small economy and they have a, a currency that's very difficult to get access to abroad. They might use something like the yuan, something like Indian rupee, Russian ruble, or another currency. So I think that's something that BRICS is really prioritizing at the moment, creating the infrastructure needed to do that. Both China and Russia have developed alternatives to the SWIFT system, the interbank messaging system dominated by the United States. And they are preparing that infrastructure to be used when necessary. Russia has already been experimenting with it. China has not yet, but it's in place for the, the possibility. They understand that the U.S. may try to do what China to China what it has done to Russia, disconnecting Chinese banks from SWIFT, applying very heavy sanctions. So this infrastructure is being built out. It's much more complicated than many people think it is. It's not as easy as just saying that we're just going to do it overnight. But these are obviously the discussions that are going to be happening and also simply deepening trade in general, not regardless of what the currencies are. So having more and more investment that cuts out the West. And this is what the West really doesn't understand. They're so stuck. We were talking about this colonial arrogance. They really still believe that they're the most powerful countries on Earth. But the BRICS economy is now taken together when you measure their GDP at purchasing power parity. It's larger than the G7, the seven imperialist countries that colonize the world. And over time, the BRICS countries have a larger and larger share of global GDP, whereas the G7 countries have a, sh a smaller and smaller share of world GDP. We see that China grows at a very healthy pace, despite all the ridiculous Western propaganda about it. India is growing quite, quite well. And many other countries interested in joining BRICS, like Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, uh, maybe potentially we'll see who else, but 
you know, uh, uh, the point is, is that, as you mentioned, over 30 countries have expressed interest in joining BRICS. So as they join, it's going to be all of the fast growing economies around the world that are also growing their real economy, unlike the Western financialized economies, yes. which have been deindustrialized. So even if you look at GDP, it's actually not the best measurement, despite the fact that, you know, BRICS is now larger in terms of GDP purchasing power parity. But if you look, for instance, at share of global manufacturing, if you look at share of oil and gas production, if you look at share of global food production, if you look at many other commodities, iron ore, uh, lithium, these are things that are needed for uh, global manufacturing. BRICS is even more powerful than the G7, which again has been relatively deindustrialized. So yes, a lot of uh, f finance is concentrated, financial power is concentrated in Wall Street in the city of London. But we see that, as we see in the war in Ukraine, okay, fine, you have all of this financial wealth but if you can't actually develop the manufacturing capabilities that you need to maintain advanced technologies or to win a war, it doesn't matter how big your GDP is. We were told by all of these neoliberal economists in the West that Russia's economy was so weak because they were using nominal GDP at, the, at, at a very unfavorable exchange rate for the Russian ruble to the dollar, not looking at Russian GDP PPP, which is actually quite high. It's one of the biggest economies on earth. But even regardless of that, regardless of GDP as a metric, if you look at Russia's manufacturing capabilities, its industrial base, we were told that Russia is so weak, but now Russia is actually growing very, very quickly. And Russia has shown that in terms of its military capabilities, its military industry is actually very strong and getting stronger. So Western, again, we were talking about this with Israel, the danger of believing your own propaganda. We see this with Western policymakers. The danger of believing your own neoliberal economic propaganda telling you that our economies are so big and strong and great, but a huge part of that is the big bubble of the financial sector. You can't eat debt, you can't eat loans, and you can't certainly develop these advanced technologies when the entire supply chain is located in the BRICS countries. Yes, indeed. Very well said, Ben. And, you know, everything you said about the state of the U.S. economy and the state of uh, really the whole collective West in terms of their economic power. Uh, it's interesting that BRICS for so long has been virtually ignored uh, or minimized in terms of its overall impact and importance. Now we see that still continue to an effect, but it's interesting that one of the biggest reports I've seen in response to BRICS come out of uh, this U.S. foreign policy blob uh, through Human Rights Watch is it reflects exactly what you said. Uh, uh, the United States is right now through its uh, through its uh, revolving door at the Human Rights Watch is talking about um, giving human rights, right? Human rights. It's not. It's not about, man, well, maybe we should actually start competing economically. Maybe we should be, uh, you know, figuring out how to do our own kind of model. And we know that the U.S. has tried, at least on the surface and aesthetically, to, you know, the Build Back Better Coalition and all this, all these uh, various uh, initiatives to compete with BRICS or China's Belt and Road Initiative or what have you. But, you know, they just... They're just advertisements that just come and go and nothing ever comes out of them. So it's just so interesting that one of the most impactful policy reports leading up to the BRICS summit coming out of the U.S. is talking about, you know, we need to focus more on human rights, right? Like human rights needs to be, what do you, BRICS? I mean, BRICS, of course, the BRICS countries, most men, you know, all of them are concerned about their own versions and definitions of human rights. But... We know that BRICS are coming together based on human rights. They're coming together to economically integrate, as you said, to prosper. To yeah, to develop, to prosper together, to figure out how to do that in a very, uh, a very unstable world, in large part because of the U.S. so-called rules-based order. But any any final thoughts? Yeah, well, this is something that's so misunderstood about BRICS because. Critics of BRICS say, you know, Western critics say, look at the internal contradictions between China and India, which have border conflicts and the Indian government's constantly criticizing China, blah, blah, blah. Or they say, look, you know, uh, 
Now you have yeah, Iran and Saudi Arabia. Well, Saudi these... Arabia hasn't officially accepted the offer, but the point yeah, is you have see... these internal not political not disputes, but they don't understand that BRICS is fundamentally <laughs> not first and foremost a political organization. It's an economic one. It consists of largely developing and emerging economies that want to create alternative economic infrastructure so they can provide more opportunities for themselves so they're no longer completely uh, choked by the U.S. dominated financial system. The global financial system was created in a way after World War II that gave the U.S. this monopoly power with the reserve currency, veto power of the, over the IMF and the World Bank. We see that the WTO has been completely just paralyzed largely by the U.S., ironically. So BRICS is an opportunity for these developing economies, emerging markets to get together and create new opportunities for trade, development, investment, infrastructure, and this is exactly what's happening. So yes, China and India have these disputes, but they're also working together in terms of economic development. These are countries that have similar histories with colonialism, with poverty, with underdevelopment. They want to lift their population out of poverty and become prosperous countries. This is true for every country that's interested in joining BRICS. And in order to do so, they need to create more space and more alternatives so they're not only reliant on a financial system that was created by the U.S. to benefit the U.S. at the expense of everyone else, period. This is why people are confused why a country like India, which has a government that is very right wing and tends to lean toward the West, is still interested in these alternatives because it's in their own economic interest. And the, but the U.S. expects every ally to subordinate their own economic interests to those of the U.S., like Europe is doing. The U.S. expects countries to commit economic suicide on behalf of Wall Street, because if it's good for Wall Street, they say it's good for the world. But we see some countries that even if they lean politically toward the West, economically, it's in their benefit to seek alternatives, like Saudi Arabia, for instance, or the United Arab Emirates which is part of the New Development Bank. These are countries that historically have been very close to the U.S., basically client regimes for decades, but now their largest trading partner is China. And increasingly, they see that China is the world's largest economy with, with GDP measured at purchase power parity. And in the years that come, it's going to keep growing significantly faster than the U.S. China is here to stay. It's a massive country with 1.4 billion people. India is a massive country with 1.4 billion people growing rapidly. They can see that it's in their economic interest to look east, not simply to the west. And the U.S., it, it, its peak was already met. It was already reached decades ago. And its influence is declining, not increasing. But the U.S. expects these countries to simply go along with what it wants, despite the fact that it has nothing to offer them. Like you said, it, it has human rights, which human means rights. nothing. It doesn't <laughs> Which is have usually the opposite structure. of human rights, too. <laughs> yeah. It, it doesn't even have, the, at, at this point, the biggest market that it used to have. Historically, the U.S. had this massive market, but China and India now are huge growing markets. So it comes down to this, this famous quote that's been attributed to many different African leaders. We don't know exactly who said it, but we've heard similar things from African officials saying, every time a Western politician visits, or every time a Chinese a politician visits Africa, different, you know, maybe some people say this was in Kenya. So every time, uh, allegedly was the former president of Kenya, every time China visits Kenya, we get a hospital, we get a school, we get a bridge. Every time a Western politician visits Kenya, we get a lecture. You can't eat a lecture 